There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? This video was made possible due to those who support me on Patreon. I'd like to give a big shout out to patrons Conrad Truitt, Dan Ray, Flake, Joseph Abrams, Kyle Kramer, Logan Cottingham, Mariah, Patrick Smith, and Stephen Dillon. Thank you all for your support. Hello those new to my channel and returning macabros, and welcome to my latest series entitled The Craft Of, which will serve as a crash course on traditional 3x structure, which is the script structure that the vast majority of Hollywood films released over the last god knows how many decades have utilized. If you haven't checked out the previous entries of this series, I would recommend doing so, as I will be building off each entry as we continue. Keep in mind that there may also be spoilers for not only the films I will be discussing in this episode, but the films I discussed in those episodes, so make sure to check the description so you don't get any of them spoiled for you. Today we will be discussing the fourth of the five major plot points, the end of the second act, or alternatively, the second act turn. The end of the second act is more often than not marked by our protagonist reaching their lowest point, where it appears that all is lost. To use some of the films we have already discussed as examples, in Dodgeball, the end of the second act is marked by Peter being convinced to sign over Average Joe's gym and abandoning his teammates, giving the rival Globo Gym an easy path to victory in the Dodgeball final. In The Dark Knight, District Attorney Harvey Dent, whom Bruce Wayne believed to be the one who would lead the citizens of Gotham to a new dawn, is corrupted by the Joker. In The Matrix, following the betrayal by Cypher, the majority of the crew of the Nebuchadnezzar are left dead and Morpheus is taken prisoner. Once the agents are able to extract from him the mainframe codes of Zion, they will be able to obliterate the entire city. If the first act turn is a fuck yeah let's fucking do it moment, then the end of the second act is a oh fuck what the fuck are we gonna do moment. I originally set out to take revenge on the evil Regina George, but oh fuck, my ego got the better of me and now my friends are pissed at me, I've disappointed my parents, absolute snack Aaron Samuels won't even look my way, and I am back to being a social outcast. I just wanted to expunge the possibly pedophilic priest from my parish. But oh fuck, the supposed victim's mother doesn't even want to press the issue, which now leaves me with no allies and zero recourse. I just wanted to find the person who imprisoned me for 15 years and discover why they did so. But oh fuck, turns out I blabbed about this dude banging his sister when we were kids, which resulted in her being tormented by her peers and taking her own life, and now I have to confront him at the most uncomfortable high school reunion in history. A picture-perfect example of the end of the second act being marked by this oh fuck exclamation can be found in the action classic Die Hard. After surviving the onslaught of, and blasting his way through, a gaggle of terrorists, it seems like police officer John McClane will be successful in rescuing the hostages being held prisoner at Nakatomi Plaza. But just then, lead terrorist Hans Gruber discovers that one of the hostages is McLean's estranged wife, Holly. McLean is forced to confront Hans and his remaining henchmen, but now with Hans holding Holly hostage, thus giving the baddies one hell of an upper hand. The stakes of your story should always be rising throughout the second act, but the end of the second act is the final gut punch, where the protagonist is faced with their most dire situation, which in most cases, leads to a final ultimatum, where our hero must go all in in a sense. However, while the end of the second act thrusts our protagonist into their most pressing moment of turmoil, this doesn't always mean it has to be as a result of the antagonist closing in. In The Matrix and Die Hard, this moment is brought about by the antagonist putting the protagonist into a position of check if you will. They are the ones pushing the story into the final act and it is up to our protagonist to decide how to react to it. But sometimes, the end of the second act can result in the antagonist actually becoming completely irrelevant to the story, but with our hero still in their most dire state. An old school example can be found in the Italian neorealist classic, Bicycle Thieves. In post-World War II Rome, Antonio Ricci is in desperate need of work to support his wife Maria and son Bruno. He gets a job hanging advertisements, but the job requires a bicycle. He and his wife sell the last of their possessions and pawn a bike, but on his first day on the job, the bike is stolen. The film then chronicles Antonio and his son setting out to find the thief and retrieve the bike. They eventually locate the thief, but are unable to incriminate him due to the thief's neighbors falsely supplying an alibi, and thus they are unable to retrieve the bike. 
Now in this case, there is no enemy closing in. Obviously the prospect of starving is a pretty lingering threat, but what I mean is that the original conflict that our protagonist set out to confront come the first act turn is resolved, just not in Antonio's favor. In Die Hard, John initially sets out to stop the terrorists, but this isn't resolved until the climax. But in Bicycle Thieves, Antonio and Bruno, while they initially set out to find the bike and retrieve it, fail in their quest, and are now at a complete loss with no way out of their predicament. Thus, the more traditional, final showdown-esque ending doesn't really fit into the story in this case. This can actually be a great way to generate suspense for your audience going into the third act. In both the cases of say Die Hard and The Matrix, it is sort of obvious as to what is going to happen in the third act, at least in terms of the final confrontation. We know that Neo is going to face off against the agents to try and rescue Morpheus, and we know that John is going to confront Hans and try to save Holly. This is by no means a slight against these films, as the tension comes from us wondering how this confrontation is going to turn out. But in Bicycle Thieves, when Antonio and Bruno are in despair, not sure of what to do, we the audience are right there with them, asking, what on earth are we going to do? But in one of the most devastating and heart-wrenching endings in film history, Antonio, horrified at the prospect of his family starving to death, decides to steal another man's bike, becoming the very thing he has been hunting the entire film, only to be apprehended and shamed by pedestrians, the father and son left to an uncertain future. Whereas in The Matrix, Die Hard, and Old Boy, we have a pretty good idea of what the final confrontation is going to be heading into the third act, in Bicycle Thieves, Mean Girls, and Doubt, how exactly things are going to play out is a bit more unclear, thus giving you more options to play with depending on the details of your story. Again, neither is better or worse than the other. It completely depends on the specifics of your story. As I stated in the very first episode, one of the biggest pains in the ass to see when you look through screenwriting guides or like a writing article or something is that they are way too specific about what needs to happen at any given moment in your script, which in turn leads to writers making their scripts a slave to three-act structure instead of seeing it as merely a skeleton that can be melded and molded to serve their story. I'll go into this more in depth when we discuss the climax, but what your climax is going to look like is completely dependent on the specifics of your story. It may be a more traditional good guy versus bad guy standoff, or it might be something more unconventional. As a writer, you want to be able to view the progression of your story from different angles so as not to get tunnel vision. However, in some cases, the end of the second act isn't necessarily marked by a certain plot turn, but rather a shift in your main character's disposition. The Shawshank Redemption tells the story of the friendship that blossoms between prison inmates Andy Dufresne and Ellis Red Redding. The film spans the length of almost two decades, yet doesn't have a plot in the conventional sense, the majority of the runtime being comprised of a series of vignettes, if you will, showing the ongoings within the prison, the day-to-day -day lives of the prisoners, their personalities and relationships, etc. The through line of the film is based less on plot and more on character. When Andy arrives at Shawshank, he is able to inspire his fellow inmates and show them that just because they are behind bars doesn't mean they cannot live fulfilling lives. The dramatic question is whether or not Andy will be able to instill hope within the men of Shawshank and retain his own optimism. However, the end of the second act occurs when new inmate Tommy arrives with information proving that Andy is innocent of killing his wife. But the cruel warden Norton, fearing that Andy's release may result in his own illegal affairs within Shawshank being revealed to the public, has Tommy killed, ensuring Andy will spend the rest of his days behind bars. Throughout the film, we see Andy suffer brutal hardships, but despite his misfortunes, he is always able to keep his hope intact. However, following Tommy's death, we we finally see Andy's spirit break, with Red later fearing that Andy plans to take his own life. I recently made a video discussing the distinction between story and plot, the plot being more in reference to the cause and effect events of the film, whereas the story is more about the thematic journey, the arc of your protagonist. In Shawshank, it isn't the plot beat of the warden's murder of Tommy that acts as the end of the second act, not necessarily. This is marked more accurately by the story beat of Andy's spirit finally breaking. Whether your film structure is dependent more on plot or story beats is completely dependent on the tale itself, 
Some beats will be completely based on plot, some story, others a mix of both. The point I am trying to make is that mapping out your story onto the template of 3-act structure is extremely flexible and even at times subjective. So don't sweat it if your story doesn't match up precisely with what you think or what others have told you needs to happen at a given point in your film. So to recap, the end of the second act is where your protagonist reaches their lowest point. Whether that means the antagonist forces them into a situation where they are at a complete loss as to what to do, such as in Die Hard and The Matrix, or the conflict that was presented and our hero set out to confront come the first act turn is seemingly resolved with your hero on the losing end of the deal, such as in Bicycle Thieves and Doubt, or there is a shift in your protagonist's disposition, as opposed to a particular plot beat, such as in The Shawshank Redemption. And it should go without saying that many films will probably have a combination or hybrid of these different types of the plot beat. However, those of you who have seen The Shawshank Redemption will know not all is as it seems when we see that Andy's spirit has been broken, which leads to quite the surprise in the third act. But we will go over that in our next episode, where I will discuss the third act twist. Now the third act twist is not necessarily just a twist in the plot of your third act, it is something different that serves a very specific purpose in terms of the trajectory of your story, and only applies to certain cases following the end of the second act. It's a bit hard to explain without diving into it fully, so I am going to save all the details for next episode, which based on the frequency of this series, will be released in about 5 months or so. Nah, I'm just kidding. I didn't realize how far I had let this project slip until a commenter on another video asked about it, so I am definitely going to make a note to finish this series as we only have 2 episodes left. For those of you who have been waiting, thank you very much for your patience. Make sure to subscribe, turn on the notifications, like, share, comment below, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you again for your support, and I'll see you next time.